let's talk about innovation. Innovation for low-cost markets. Not ideas, not even inventions, but innovations. And that pathway from idea to innovation, boy, it's far. And how do we keep ideas alive? Well, we need to rethink what we build, how we build it, and how we share the things that we build. And we need new business models that are gonna help us figure out how to do that. So one of my favorite things about the work that I've done over the years is that I've discovered good ideas can come from anywhere in the world. So whether it's an auto mechanic in Argentina who comes up with an idea for saving the lives of mothers and babies during obstructed labor, his name is Odon, it's kind of brilliant, or it's citizens who face crumbling infrastructure and figure out how to hack together a DIY payphone for their community. Non-experts can be really great at figuring out how to solve problems. They don't necessarily know the boundaries of a problem space, and so they come up with these creative ideas. Often these ideas are really inspiring. They can be infectious. But an idea, ultimately, it's not an innovation. An innovation is what happens after we have those ideas. It's the hard work that we do to bring those ideas into the world so that they can have impact. So I'll tell you a story now uh, about how that didn't happen. So several years ago, I was working at the university and I, I was working on a project for a low-cost ultrasound system. I was working with students and with radiologists and we partnered with some midwives in Uganda. And our charge was, how could you make low-cost ultrasound and make it simpler to use? And we were working on user interface elements on software. We came up with a variety of pretty good ideas. We simplified the measurement process. We built in a learning system. Uh, we just we made it a lot easier to use. And the midwives loved it. Like, they could just use it out of the box. It was amazing. And so we thought, OK, let's try to keep this alive. And so we went and we met with some medical device manufacturers, and we said, so we know that you're interested in these low-cost markets. This tested really well in the field. Here, would you like it? And um, when they said, no, thank you. And then we came back again and we said, OK, let's clarify. We're academics and we published on this, so it's free. Are you sure you don't want it? Because we can give you our data. And they said, no, thank you. And we went back again and again. And finally, some vice president from one of the companies, he took me aside and he said, OK, look, we could make cheaper technology but it wouldn't support the cost of our sales force. So we have no motivation to do so. And I thought, oh, so this is how good ideas die. But then I also thought, are we sure that that's the only business model? Is that the only way that it's viable to sell these kinds of things? Because innovation, and we know, we know that ultrasound example is just one tiny piece of a really complicated puzzle. So there are professors and students around the world who have great ideas languishing in their lab. There are tinkerers in their garage. There are hackathons and competitions. So many great ideas that just never make it out into the world and have impact. And innovation is hard, not denying that. I mean, if we think about how long it took touchscreen technology to make it into our cell phones, that was a long time, and that was innovation at a premium. And if you're talking about innovation for low cost, it can be even more challenging. But it can also have even more impact, because we're talking about five billion people in the world who could benefit from technologies like stoves or better water filters, new sanitation technologies. That's a big market, five billion people. People who want products that can make their communities safer, save them time, make their families healthier, and make them happier. But we need new business models to get us from the ideas to the innovation and really make products that serve these markets. So what I did is I started a company focused on making low-cost sort of medical and health and wellness products for the developing world. And I'm gonna share with you some of the stories of our work to rethink what we make how we make it, and how we share it. So the first is, what are we going to choose to make? We followed a human-centered 
design process. And that means we started by talking to doctors and midwives and nurses and saying, hey, what kinds of problems do you have? We listened to them and they told us some of the challenges. And then we partnered with members from the global open innovation community to get suggestions on how to solve those problems. And so one of the things that came out of all of that work, one of the problems that clinicians were having had to do with the fact that they don't have access to infusion pumps, right? So they're administering fluids and they have to do it manually. And when you do it manually, this is how it works. You've got a bag and you've got drops coming down and you count the drops as they come down, how many drops per minute. And then you do some math in your head to convert that to a milliliter per hour flow rate but that also depends on the kind of tubing set, so the equations differ. So as you can imagine, it's pretty error prone. And they wanted something simple that was gonna make this process easier and more precise, because sometimes you really do need that precision. So we came up with this drip clip thing, uh, which could give them that immediate feedback and help provide more precision. Super simple, not a complicated piece of technology, but what we're trying to do is rethink what's even worth our while to make. So then we are starting to grapple with, okay, how are we actually gonna make it? Because prototype to product, oof, that's hard. So we're sitting around and we're negotiating, going through, how are we gonna make this? And we got a mechanical engineer and we've got an electrical engineer and an interaction designer and uh, we're going through this spec sheet, our requirements document, which is really just a whole long list of compromises of trade-offs between functionality and price. So we're figuring out how we're gonna make this device and we get to the question of what kind of battery are we gonna use? So this prototype used AA batteries and it was clunky, it didn't balance well, it was pretty ugly. I mean, there were all sorts of problems with it. And it becomes gradually clear to us that AA batteries just aren't gonna work. Someone suggests we use a coin cell. So we're like, oh, okay, well maybe that's what we need to do. And we start playing around with that and we realize that if we start using a coin cell, it opens up all these mechanical design options for us, improves the aesthetics. We no longer have a balance problem with how the device sits. Obviously, this is gonna be the way we go. But in addition to that team of engineers around the table, right, we've also got our medical advisor who's living in Uganda, and he's sort of at the table. He's in the computer, so he's on Skype, sitting at the corner of the table. And so we're going through and we're sort of marching through our list and coming up with these decisions, and we figure out this is the right way to deal with our engineering battery problem, and he's screaming from the computer. And so we turn and we're like, well, what's the problem? And he says, no. We said, well, no, we have to do this. I mean, you, you see that this is the right decision for us to make, is to go with that coin cell. And he said, no, you can't do that. He said, I don't have access to coin cells here. No one, you can't go to the corner store and get coin cells, you can't source them. If you put a coin cell in that device, this is what's gonna happen. That battery will run out the first time, and then someone will put that device in a drawer and they will never use it again. And so we had to step back and rethink the decisions we were making about how to engineer this device. And what we thought was that right decision of the coin cell actually absolutely wrong. We needed to reprioritize and think, okay, as we make these decisions, how are we gonna make this commercially viable for that low cost setting? So we're rethinking what we make, how we make it, and then there's this question of how to share it. So how do you get it into the hands of consumers in the world? Distribution models. So this is a uh, product from PATH, the Global Health NGO, uh, that they did in conjunction with a variety of partners, including the University of Washington. And it's a low cost process to flash heat and pasteurize human milk. And so what it does is it allows HIV positive mothers to safely give their milk to their babies. Great product, it's been used in a few uh, hospitals in South Africa for a while now. Science is really solid. But one of the characteristics of this device is its modularity. So you can see that there's a variety of different components there. And so we provide the temperature monitoring, but things like that hot plate or the, the bottles or even the, the pan that's used, those are things that people locally source. And the modularity is what allows it to be low cost. So we wanna keep that, but if we're depending on local infrastructure, right, and we're depending on local manufacturing for people to be able to source products, that introduces a lot of risk. Because sometimes your infrastructure is enough to snuff, right? Sometimes you've got roads that are seasonally dependent or you know, you've got gas stations that are basically temporary installations. And so you gotta think, well, if we really wanna keep this modularity and so that we can maintain that low cost, how are we gonna handle that distribution system? 
and make sure that people get a good product. And so, you know, what you can do is you can embed redundancy into the system and robustness, and that's, that's what we have. So basically, it's a solution where you have any kind of stove that you can get. It doesn't matter the BTUs, doesn't even matter what kind of fuel you use. But we have a temperature monitoring system that's robust enough that it'll give you solid pasteurization results, regardless of what you can get locally. So ultimately, there are so many people in the world who have great ideas, they're passionate, they're committed, they're brilliant. And there's so many of those ideas that just stop short of actually being an innovation. But if we can think, and if we can rethink what we make, how we make it, and how we share it, and if we can come up with new business models to support that, pretty sure we can take a whole lot more of those ideas, bring them through the innovation process, and give them a chance to improve the world. So thank you. Nice.